Adventure, anyone? <laughs> How does that simple invitation dilate our eyes, raise the hair on our skin, and make us want to lean in? What does that word conjure up for you? Is it a bold or daring undertaking? Or perhaps a unique experience in a remote corner of the world? And why is this word used up to 1.4 million times an hour in our mediums of modern digital storytelling? I want to address these questions with you today on a journey, explaining how adventure connects us, how it makes us better people, and perhaps how it could make for a better world. My journey's brought me here, 26,000 feet high on the north ridge of Mount Everest. Looks adventurous, perhaps heroic, but let me start by filling you in on a secret. The mind does not always feel heroic on adventure, and it's really hard to feel heroic when you really need to pee. <laughs> I thought I was well prepared, but nobody told me how, when nature calls, I'm going to navigate through four inches of down with two inches of glove, complete this whole ordeal without frostbite to the important bits. <sighs> Humbling discovery indeed. An adventure has a way of challenging you as well. And in my mind, I am just terrified at that very day. Because two weeks prior, I had just received terrible news. Scratchy and broken over a satellite phone transmission, I heard the words, sorry, Terry, but Charlie is dead. My dear friend and climbing partner had just had his last climb and tragically perished in an avalanche accident high in the Canadian Rockies while I was high in the Himalaya. And so now I'm a conflicted climber. Thoughts of Charlie swirling in my head as I'm plodding along one crampon in front of the other. I grab my oxygen mask and I give it a squeeze, ice breaking off that's clinging at the corners. I take this deep breath and the sweet cool passes over my lips. I never thought oxygen could taste so good. I never thought oxygen actually had a taste. And it strikes me that may not be a good thing. Why, after losing Charlie, am I drawn like a moth to a flame to this summit? Why am I doing this? And the debate continued footstep after footstep until 29,000, 29 feet. There's nothing left to climb. A place where earth ends and sky begins, and I was totally awestruck. And then something interesting happened. Why at that moment did my thoughts then turn to a woman named Pasong. She too had just died that year, passed away from a heart disease, easily preventable here in the developed world. And I felt sorrow for her loss. But I was filled with a sense of gratitude for the time that I had spent with her in the year prior, caring for the neglected children in her village high on the Tibetan plateau. And I felt compelled to go back there again. And then my thoughts turned to my dad, and I just wanted to give him a hug. In my youth, he was my shark in the pool, my grizzly bear chasing me around in his checkerboard slacks. <sighs> he was the man that taught me fear is real, but something that perhaps you could look right in the eye and play with. On the summit, I thought about everything my father had done for me. And I wanted so much to be there for him in the year prior to that day. To remind him that he too could stare down his own fear before he decided to take his own life. I just wanted to remind him that I loved him. Why, when having this peak experience of my own, was I connected to the lives and losses of others? And why did adventure bring me to this place? Look, I tell my story because the value of adventure is misunderstood. Externally, people see our risks and our endeavors as a fool's errand. We're out there just to prove ourselves. 
But there is this internal journey, a private transcendence that makes these peak experiences for us stand out from everyday events and makes us want to transcend again. In this thirst for adventure, you know, you don't have to quench it by climbing Mount Everest or even skiing down a mountainside, but you all have it. DRD4, this is the adventure gene in our DNA. Postulated by many to be the reasons why our ancestors pushed forth across oceans, desert, arctic, tundra. Look, the reason why we strive for these rarefied experiences, what makes adventure imagery so captivating is we are in fact hardwired to want this warm glow of satisfaction when we satiate this adventure gene. And why would we evolve with that? Well, something magic happens with that awe, which is good for the species. Here's an example you're going to relate to. Who was here on August 21st? Who still has the glasses? <laughs> How did you feel when the moon brought night to the day sky? What was your internal journey, and who were you connected to? Speaking of cosmic phenomenon, let's now consider an image so awe-inspiring, it became the most reproduced photograph in history. The blue marble from the NASA Apollo 17 mission in 1972. An image that became the very embodiment of the overview effect synonymous with this concept of awe, and its impact probably best described by Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell when he said, you develop this instant global consciousness, a people orientation, a dissatisfaction with the state of the world, but a compulsion to do something about it. Look, this curious translation of awe to altruism has recently become the focus of academic research. We're finding that awe, like a community or religious experience, helps us to bind to others, motivating us to act in collaborative ways. And individuals who experience awe more frequently in their daily lives also are more likely to sacrifice and give more resources to others. And the effect can be instantaneous. In one brilliant study, researchers asked some participants to stand out in the forest, look up into the canopy, nearby a campus, while other subjects were forced to look at the blank facade of a science building. And then, in just one minute, a planned accident occurred. A passerby stumbled and dropped some pens. And guess what? The individuals looking up into the forest canopy were much more likely to bend down, grab the pens, and offer help to that other person. Could it be that we have evolved in community because of awe? because it orients our actions to give that helping hand? Could a life of adventure in search of this awe not be selfish, but actually selfless? Look, we are all hardwired for adventure. And in adventure, we find awe. And awe benefits us all by orienting our actions towards the lives and needs of others around us. Yes, Everest was significant, but it was really about me feeling insignificant, but connected to something greater. Since that time, I've tried to refine that fabric by practicing a path of my personal adventures woven with a life of service. And my path has taken me from the high Himalaya to the slums of Calcutta. But I'm not the only one to be on such a path, and I am only one story. Since that time, I've committed my efforts to interview some of the world's most inspiring and accomplished adventurers, learning about their journeys. I've discovered how the search for awe has led to partnerships for Porter's progress and welfare in the high reaches of Pakistan. How adventures have led to the removal of unexploded ordnance along the war-torn plains of Laos. And relief for the widowed families of mountain workers in the high Himalaya. And I'm looking forward to learning more. What do I hope for you? Go on an adventure. Whether you find your awe looking up into the trees, the night sky, or in the mountains, these moments 
will always be oxygen for our souls. I just ask you to remember why you might feel that way. Perhaps our journeys are less about what we have just achieved, but more about who we are about to become and what we are going to give in return. When you find your calling, share your story. Let's all inspire Adventures for a Better World. Thank you.